Welcome to Distancing with the Stars. My name is Eric McLaughlin, and I'm the astronomer for the Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. Our itinerary for today takes us well beyond our solar system. We will be visiting a small set of places in a branch of astronomy whose success has long been dreamed of, but has only been realized within my lifetime. Extrasolar planets, or exoplanets, are simply planets found outside of the solar system. So far we have found well over 4,000 of them, and they are astonishingly varied in their characteristics and configurations. We cannot visit all of them now, but we've picked out a few you should find interesting. As we venture forth, note how the asterisms, the stick figures of the constellations, distort with our changing perspective on the stars at each vertex. When searching for planets around distant stars, some configurations are a bit easier to detect than others. The relative ease of detecting objects with high masses and tight orbits meant that we initially found a higher fraction of a type of exoplanets often referred to as hot Jupiters. With a published discovery in 2017, this is KELT 9b, a more recent hot Jupiter discovery. It is an extreme example of such worlds, and it only takes one and a half Earth days to orbit its star. In fact, it is the hottest known exoplanet, and the planet is so close to its host star that its atmosphere is being torn away by the star's radiation, extending the gases into a comet-like tail. How exactly these massive worlds can end up so close to their stars is still an area of active research. Do they migrate close to their stars through one of a number of mechanisms, or do they form where we find them? Perhaps no one solution will address all of these scorched worlds. We'll just have to keep working to find out. Hot Jupiters are fascinating worlds, but they are not the only surprising configuration of planetary systems. Indeed, we have found other worlds that even recently some considered impossible. Yes, I once sat in on a talk which indicated that a planet orbiting a pair of stars would be unstable, and thus we should not expect to find any. Some years later, that hypothesis was proven false by observation. In fact, I was even taught by some of those whose analysis revealed the circumbinary planets of our next destination. Welcome to the Kepler-47 system, the first multiplanetary system found around two stars. These three planets orbit far enough from the pair of stars to orbit them securely, but they are still close enough to clearly see the pair of stars set at the end of the day. However, while no public mention of circumbinary planets is complete without at least a passing reference to Tatooine from Star Wars, these worlds are too big and too low density to be like the dusty world the Skywalkers once called home. Nevertheless, the outer two planets, D and C, do lie within the circumbinary habitable zone, the region where, theoretically, a planet like Earth could have sustained liquid water on its surface. As this is the first multiplanetary circumbinary system found, it is worth noting that exoplanets are initially designated with lowercase letters in order of discovery, starting with B. Thus, while B and C were discovered together, and thus designated innermost to outermost, the middle planet was discovered later, receiving the designation D. This follows quite well from the pattern set for many binary and multiple star systems, where the stars are designated alphabetically with capital letters, and the brightest star receiving the designation A. This system will always remind me of how science works, how observation supersedes expectation. Now from worlds orbiting more than their fair share of stars, to one with, well, fewer. This interesting object is PSO J318.5-22, essentially a rogue planet without a host star. It's the size of a planet, but with some features similar to those of cool brown dwarf stars. PSO J318 stood out to astronomers for its extremely red color when compared to other objects in the Beta Pictoris moving group of stars. At approximately 80 light years from Earth, it is able to be directly imaged by telescopes from Earth, something that cannot be said for many exoplanets and exoplanet candidates. The color, magnitude, or brightness, uh, atmospheric composition, intensity, and mass are similar to other young, dusty planets that have been discovered. It's illustrated here as glowing red, which of course it is. In fact, its effective temperature is about the same as the furnace shown here. Planetary formation can be complicated, but how is it possible that a planet loses its host star? 
One possibility is that forces other than the gravity from the host star were acting on the planet and caused it to go rogue. When more than two objects are involved, motion can become quite complex, possibly even complex enough to cause a planet to stray away from the star system from whence it came. PSO J318 is a bit bigger than Jupiter, but is actually 6.5 times more massive than our neighborhood giant. Nevertheless, PSO J318 is a quite long way from being a hydrogen fusing star, in mass at least. Size-wise, however, this rogue planet is actually potentially larger than the star of our next destination. Again, potentially larger, but nowhere near as massive. The star we are going to weighs in under 100 times the mass of Jupiter, which brings it near the lower limit of where we can expect nuclear fusion to be possible in its core. Welcome to TRAPPIST-1, the mini solar system analog. Like the solar system, the TRAPPIST-1 system has planets distributed over a large enough range of orbital radii that some should be hot, others cold, and some that could be just right. However, because the star is so low mass, it's much cooler than the sun, so all of its planets need to be much closer to it to get those temperature levels. Moreover, the masses of all of these worlds lie between around one third to two times the mass of the Earth. Likewise, their small radii suggest that all of these worlds might be terrestrial. One may actually be able to land there. Of particular interest are the planets D and E because they both lie within the star's habitable zone. However, these planets all may be tidally locked to the star, always having one side of each planet facing towards the star in the same way one side of the moon always faces the Earth. We have a lot of work to do to fully understand what tidal locking means for overall planetary habitability. Still, being in the right place and the right size, these worlds seem to check a lot of boxes when it comes to being potentially habitable. But don't hold your breath and dive into an as yet only imagined ocean. For a planet to truly be habitable like Earth, the star it orbits may matter more than we had originally anticipated. Now, TRAPPIST-1 is a special place, but there is another exoplanet that is nearer to our hearts. At least, literally. This is Proxima b, a planet orbiting the nearest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri. There is evidence of potentially another planet in the system, but Proxima b is of particular note because it is in the habitable zone of Proxima Centauri. As with TRAPPIST-1, Proxima Centauri is a red dwarf star, which is much less massive and much cooler than the Sun. This makes the habitable zone of stars like these very near the stars themselves. That would not be a problem, except that red dwarfs like Proxima Centauri can be rather temperamental. Frequent stellar flares, which emit significant amounts of ultraviolet light, have likely destroyed any remnant of a potential protective ozone layer. Indeed, the UV and X-ray radiation from the intense flare activity of Proxima Centauri may render the star-facing surface of Proxima b entirely sterile. Such observations are bad news for all potentially Earth-like planets around red dwarfs, including those around TRAPPIST-1. The radiation from these stars may even be intense enough to slowly strip atmospheres off of their planets. The erosion of their atmospheres may not be as dramatic as what we saw at KELT 9b, but it is still problematic for the prospects of life on worlds around red dwarfs. So perhaps our gaze is better spent looking for life around stars like that one over there. Though if we can learn anything from the discovery of circumbinary planets, perhaps we shouldn't count out the red dwarfs yet. Nevertheless, even if we did narrow our search to just stars like our own, a recent study suggests that perhaps half of all such stars in the Milky Way could harbor terrestrial planets in orbits potentially favorable to life. When compared to all of the planets around the myriad of stars in our galaxy, it's quite a small fraction that would then be potentially favorable. And yet, given the vast nature of the universe, that small fraction is still on the order of 300 million potentially habitable worlds. 300 million potential planets to find life. 300 million potential planets where we might even be able to live. 
we have only begun to understand the manifold worlds scattered across the Milky Way. But with each observation, advancement, and calculation, we stretch ourselves just a bit further. Indeed, we sit as an infant lying in their cradle, a hand just reaching beyond the bars, still yet to fully grasp the knowledge of the home we will one day inhabit. <laughs>